Hey, hey, welcome back to Turn Bar Time, episode 18. I am the Turn. I'm the Bark. We're going to be here a long time. As you can tell by behind us, this is a four content episode for our eighth graders. And we're going to talk about Manifest Destiny. We talked about the original painting uh, in 1872 by John Gass. So now we're going to talk about the development of the United States and the growth uh, it took from us to go from sea to shining sea. Okay, so the first thing that's up, if we look at our map really quickly, right behind my beautiful noggin, that beautiful brown area, is the Louisiana Purchase. Um, so to go over that really quickly, uh, there was this dude named Napoleon in France um, who was – everybody – Random side note, everybody always thinks he was really short. And so there's this like Napoleon complex. He was actually average height for the time. His personal guard were really, really tall and they wore really tall hats. It just made him look small by comparison, but he was actually average height. So that's actually a misnomer that's actually pretty popular, popularly put out as a historical fact that he was short and had a small man complex when in reality that wasn't true. Anyways, so Napoleon's fighting like Europe. He, he's fighting everybody um and so he needs money and so he decides that before america just goes and takes louisiana and he doesn't have soldiers to go fight back for it because he's too busy fighting europe um he's like well maybe i could sell it get some cheddar and then right take that capital and use it to go fight more in europe and so this is where again we talked about how jefferson was a very was a strict constructionist of the constitution saying that, that, well, it doesn't say the president can do that, which he was all about until it came about where they were like, well, $15 million for the Mississippi river to the Rocky mountains. Does the president have the power to do that? And Jefferson was like, doesn't say that it I can't where in the past he was very much of the mindset. If it didn't say it, you couldn't do it. And then when it was, he, he saw the obvious upside for America to doing that and, you know, kind of was pragmatic and said, you know, this is good for the country. Yeah, it was, I mean, really we're talking doubling the size of the country with the stroke of the pen and by signing that treaty. So what had happened was he had also sent over, he was trying to buy New Orleans was the original plan for 7.5 million. And again, I referenced this uh, multiple times in our, our uh, uh, PowerPoint that we're sending out too, is that, you got to think that's 7.5 million in 1803. So we're talking trillions of dollars today to buy this. But again, doubling the size of the country, he saw the benefit of it. And so he, he just took it. And uh, the Senate actually debates it. What's fun fact about this too is, is $15 million, like in today's money sounds like a lot. Trillions of dollars sounds like a lot. We bought Louisiana for two to three cents an acre. That's good value. That's that's like Walmart bargain bin right there. Yeah, seriously. And and I mean, you talk about the amount of of land you acquire and the resources. Like we can think of the natural resources that come with all these different uh, eventual states that will will fall in line. Uh, and so Jefferson basically sends out an expedition. He takes his personal secretary, uh, Meriwether Lewis, and he calls up a buddy, William Clark, who's an army captain, and they set off to try and figure out what we bought because <laughs> it's basically like think of it, it, it this is a modern this is a modern day comparison of what been going to like the moon or going to mars right it was it was completely unknown uncharted people had been there and written books and said like oh this is what's there but to give you an idea it's thought of at this time that woolly mammoth still wander the rocky mountains in 1804 Right. So they don't know what they're going to run into. And they're also looking for the Northwest Passage. People thought that there was a water route um, that would connect essentially the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean, which is something that everybody who explores the American continents begin looking for. And eventually, like the only one that really does exist, goes up through the Arctic Ocean, which is covered in ice and is, um, is not really feasible. And then people decided eh, eventually we'll cheat and we'll just dig a ditch through panama yep. you know yeah. hashtag spoilers yeah. um of history to come but anyway lewis and clark go over there they 
they go out to uh, end up at Fort Clatsop. If you ever get a chance to go out to the Oregon coast by Astoria, Fort Clatsop is very nice. I've been there multiple times as a child um, and participated in their historical reenactments. And for, for Washington, too, like the, the big thing is uh, William Clark actually ventures up uh, Long Beach, Washington. So down on the coast, he and there's a tree that he supposedly like carved his name into. You know, William Clark was here 1805, blah, blah, blah. Uh, it's not there anymore. I was actually super bummed when I went to Long Beach. And like I was like, I'm going to go to the William Clark tree. And it was like a three mile hike from my hotel. And I was like, I'm doing it. And I walked up there and it was a metal tree statue. And I was like, oh, bummer. <laughs> like, it's not the real tree. But. I mean, it's still there. So, so they ventured up and down the coast, um, and then they come, they head back, and they're trying to find any water routes they can. Uh, and so they actually break apart and then meet at the um, meet at a certain part on the Missouri River and head back. Big thing about them is they are responsible for bringing back over 120 uh, animal specimens. And again, we're not talking alive, right? We're sending back the you know pelts, skulls, things like that. Uh, they send back over 200 plants, uh, botanical plants, and uh, they're not the first contact, but they're the first contact formally from the United States with multiple Native American tribes in which they hand out like peace medals and things like that. And two things that helped them be received peacefully was the fact that they hired Touchant Charbonneau, Charbonneau, who was a French uh, fur trapper who was supposed to help translate. He wasn't very useful. It was actually his wife, um, Sacagawea, who was more like a slave that he bought. But uh, anyway, the fact that they were traveling with her and then she eventually gave birth to Jean-Baptiste, her little son, with Toussaint Charbonneau, and the fact that they were traveling with a woman and a child, you know, war parties don't travel with women and children. And then they also had York, who was, I can't remember, I think it was Clark's slave. Clark's slave. And a lot of Native American cultures had never experienced an African-American or a black person before. And so that was kind of like something where they were like, it was kind of a, kind of a conversation starter um, to enter into negotiations and like have a conversation rather than just immediately becoming hostile and, and you know, seeing them as a war party. Yep. So. And they're, and they're really big about avoiding conflict. There's one conflict with the Sioux tribe, uh, what we would know today as like modern North and South Dakota uh that gets close to being hostile but but actually is is quickly diffused um and so i mean that's that's basically louisiana so in 18 uh by 1806 we kind of have a rough idea but but we map out a huge part of the country um you know we have maps of the missouri river the snake river the columbia we kind of know where to cross the rocky mountains at uh so and the other thing is this starts to we don't own Oregon yet, right? The claim stops at the Rocky Mountains, but this starts put putting it in people's minds that Americans could move here and claim the area because Oregon, as we'll talk about later, is disputed. And so if people move there, we can start to, to say, oh, well, these are Americans living here. So, yeah. Uh, go ahead. So the next one is Florida, right down here, the Florida Secession. Uh, which goes back as a throwback to our friend Andrew Jackson, friend, um, which happens in, was it 1819? Yeah, 1819 is the official treaty. And so essentially the problem was is that there were Seminole Native Americans were raiding into Georgia, and people in Georgia were concerned that there was going to be a slave uprising and things of that nature. And then the was it John Quincy Adams was the president. Uh, gave, no, it's it's Monroe as president. Oh, sorry, but Monroe gives them permission to go in there and kind of they say you know prevent any more problems with the Seminoles, right. and Andrew Jackson kind of takes some creative licenses with that, and wow. essentially it kind of comes down to this idea where the American government looks at the Spanish government and says if you're not going to control your people, we're going to take it because we'll control it. Governor get out is the the motto that's used by many historians is that that's what they took. And the other thing that that kind of plays into this too as well is that slaves are running away and instead of having to run all the way up to the north, they're running away to the south into Florida because they know that Americans can't cross into Spanish territory to try and 
reclaim them. Uh, Jackson, when Parker says he goes rogue, Jackson goes really rogue. Not only does he fight the Seminoles, he also attacks Spanish military posts. Um, and he finds two British uh, subjects that are um, imploring the Indians to keep attacking. And so he hangs both of them and because he 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 arrests them he's the judge at the trial and he's the he makes sure they get sentenced to execution uh he also kicks out the governor of florida the spanish appointed governor of florida he kicks out and he puts an american in his place and that's where barker was saying john quincy adams comes in because monroe's like i don't even know what to do right now like i told him to go take care of natives and now spain's mad like what and everyone in monroe's cabinet basically says you need to fire Jackson and you need to apologize to Spain. But Quince, John Quincy Adams is the secretary of state. And he says, no, you should be blunt and issue the governor get out statement. And Spain not wanting to fight a war with us says, okay, you know, we can have it, but we get, you got to give us $5 million for Florida. And you have to recognize that we own Texas. And America says, sure, that's fine. We'll do that. No problem. Well, Barker, what's going to happen next? <laughs> which, yeah, which works out really well because uh, two years later, they, they lose all of New Spain. And this, you know, new little country called Mexico appears. And so Spain essentially loses everything that they had in America. But everything that Spain owned becomes everything now that Mexico owns. And so with that, we talk about the Texas War of Independence or the Texas Revolution. So Texas eventually, or sorry, Texas started as part of a, a state in Mexico. It was actually called Tejas y Coahuila. This is the best I can come up with a pronunciation for that. It's, a, it's one of the 32 states right now, but like everybody that I've run into in Quincy has trouble pronouncing it. Um, but anyway, people in Texas... It's, the problem is there's a lot of Americans that are showing up. Like this guy named Moses Austin has a son named Stephen Austin. Maybe like named a college after him or something. Um, but anyway, he kind of cuts a deal with the Spanish government before they go under and it becomes Mexico to start bringing in American families just so that they can put people in the territory and start making it, you know, I guess solidifying that they own it and giving people permission to live there. But the problem is, is that they're allowing, instead of allowing more Mexicans to come from like southern, like I guess central and southern Mexico into northern Mexico, they're allowing immigrants to come from, from the east, from the United States, which is really what kind of sours the pot. Well, and they're encouraging it too. Like they're yeah. they're recruiting. They're trying to go out and bring people. Well, so basically to be like when Mexico wins its independence. They're kind of okay with the Americans being there, right? But there's a couple of things you have to do. Like, you have to renounce citizenship, right? Like, to the United States, you need to be a Mexican citizen. And you need to learn Spanish, right? Because that's the official language of Mexico. So, like, all documents and everything are going to be written in Spanish. Well... And be Catholic. Yeah, and be Catholic. And... Again, if you trace our history, uh, the United States history back, uh, America is bounded by Protestant religion, right? English speaking people. And so they don't take too kindly to this. They don't take too kindly. Um, but, uh, and so Mexico basically does what they're supposed to do and tries to govern Texas. So when people start showing up, it's ironic that Americans actually illegally immigrate to Texas. So we have Americans that are undocumented or illegally, whatever word choice is your preference, uh, come into Mexico and, and try to, you know, colonize it and rally it up. And, and eventually uh, Mexico closes off uh, immigration from the United States. And we run into a problem now where Stephen F. Austin goes to have a conversation with the Mexican president, General Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana. And he actually gets thrown in jail for like two years and instead of like getting heard and like voicing his concerns, they just throw him in jail. And so of course that makes Texas so happy 
right? They're like, oh yeah, the guy we sent is you just threw him in jail. So we're gonna we're gonna be really pumped about that. Yeah, and then it kind of gets into this. This is where we kind of it all starts as battle like where at Gonzales where they have a cannon that the Mexican government had given the people to fight the Native Americans. Well, now they've taken the cannon and they're pointing at the Mexican army, three to 500 soldiers that have come up to help kind of reinstitute the law. And there's the famous Gonzalez flag, which is a white flag with a cannon on it. And it says, come and take it, you know, and a lot of this people make analogies back to like the Greeks at Thermopylae, you know, having that come and take it mentality. So Eventually, it leads to the Battle of the Alamo, and I talk about this in the slide. The Alamo is a is a mission; it's not a fort. No. But like a just under 200, either Texians or Tejanos, depending on their you know ethnic background, are there defending the Alamo, which is out right in, right outside of San Antonio. San Antonio de Bejar is what it's called at the time. Um, Santa Ana marches his army up there. He has superior numbers, superior firepower. He actually has trained soldiers um, instead of, you know, kind of re rebels. And he's passed in an edict saying that they're treating all rebels like pirates. And so instead of being treated by, like enemy combatants, where if you surrender, you know, you have to be taken care of and then you can be like kind of ransom back to your country. These people are criminals that are fighting against the government so they don't get that due process, they can be put to death. And so this is where history becomes mythology a little bit yeah. because, you know, a lot of the people at the, Al all the defenders at the Alamo pretty much get wiped out, but yet we have these really great details of what happened. And a lot of it is like kind of tertiary, you know, somebody told somebody who told somebody who told somebody, you know, and like 40 years later, somebody wrote it in a newspaper and that's what we write as gospel. So, you know, nobody had a camera we're trying to get Mexican sources. And like one of the sources of this is David Crockett, the guy hey. right here in the buckskin, Davy Crockett. No. <laughs> he would, if it? he would come out of his grave, he would punch you in the face. That man was a Tennessee congressman. He was not Davy Crockett. <laughs> um, but he was there. And like there's this romanticized image of him. You know, he had like his trusty rifle and it's, there was a play about him during the time when he was alive that kind of fictionalized him as this frontiersman, you know, kind of like blew it out of proportions, made him a living legend. But then it, it, it's reinvigorated by Walt Disney yep. who makes these, the Davy Crockett. I, I grew up watching. Yep. I saw um, hash, they're on Disney plus hashtag Disney plus. Um, Born but like top Tennessee, <laughs> the land of the free. <laughs> Keep yeah. going. I know the whole song. Don't worry, I know the whole song. <laughs> but uh, after that, you have John Wayne who makes an Alamo movie. And then there's a ton of Alamo movies that keep coming out. And a lot of them are terribly racist and depict the Mexican army as these just bloodthirsty savages that are just going to you know kill women and children indiscriminately. When in reality, like from a Mexican perspective, like, they're trying to protect what's theirs, yeah. you know, and they weren't indiscriminately killing men, women, and children, you know. And so, like, finally, I think in the early 2000s, there was one, an Alamo made that has the Dennis, it Dennis Quaid. Yeah. Yep. That's, that's actually yeah. pretty, does a pretty good job of honoring Tejanos, which would be, you know, uh, like Mestizo Texans, you know, people of like Mexican ancestry that were in Texas, as well as Texians which would be Anglo or like American Texans, which for far too long, it was always kind of like this, you know, whites versus Mexicans where this, now you're seeing a more accurate depiction where it was about politics. It wasn't about race. Yeah. And and one of the big things here that, that needs to be stressed is the reality of the situation. Because again, like Barker said, this is a total myth um, that's built up, right? It was, it was everyone died fighting to the last man. And along with David, David Crockett is uh, Jim Bowie is there. And if you've ever looked at, heard of a Bowie knife, he's the supposed inventor of this knife. And it's thought that, you know, he was in his bed and he was killing Mexican soldiers with his knife and he was going to town. And we know these things uh, partially because Santa Ana actually let women and children live. Uh, he, he arranged for them to leave before the battle took place and they were allowed to leave no 
harm came to them. And then on top of that, uh, there were women that stayed at the battle that were, you know, standing by their men, but what they didn't, they didn't get killed by the battle. Uh, and so we have evidence now that Jim Bowie had really bad tuberculosis. And so when they found, when the, the Mexican army found him, it was thought that he was just executed, you know, shot, you know, by a group. And then we have numbers of survivors of the Battle of the Alamo that are executed. And it's known that D David Crockett was executed after the battle was over. Um, so, again, that's, that's kind of that. So what this becomes is a huge rallying cry, though. Because, again, like the Boston Massacre to the American Revolution, the Alamo is propaganda, right? They massacred our, our troops, and, and they stood there occupying the Mexican army so our army could continue. Well, the army from Texas has another really bad massacre at Goliad. And so it becomes, remember the Alamo and remember Goliad. And uh, they're chased around by Santa Ana's army. However, they find a, a peak opportunity. Santa Ana actually is resting his army by a river. And he, I think, if I remember correctly, he's drunk and has like women folk around him. And Texans see the opportunity and they attack and it's a surprise attack and they actually capture Santa Ana and force him to sign a treaty declaring Mexico an, an independent state. Texas is an independent state. Sorry, not Mexico. Texas is an independent state. Um, yeah, what it was is that he was, ex Santa Ana had expected them to attack in the morning. They didn't attack in the morning, so he rested his men, essentially stood down, and then they attacked in the afternoon. So, like, you know, again, uh, I talk about it on the slide about breaking convention, breaking military convention, uh, very much like Washington did by crossing the Delaware on, you know, right around Christmas when people didn't expect you to be out being aggressive. Yeah. So um, now keep in mind that Texas will become independent in 1836, but does not become part of the United States until 1845. So for like, you know, nine, almost 10 years, Texas is kind of like their on the edge of America saying we could be America. But again, uh, the political ramifications of annexing Texas is that it's a slap in the face to Mexico and you you risk going to war with Mexico. And the United States, again, really isn't on very solid footing as a military power, despite my amazing you know outfit. Exactly. So anyway, uh, there are a couple of presidents who have the opportunity to annex Mexico or annex Texas. I keep saying Mexico, annex Texas. And they don't take it because again, they know the ramifications, but there's also another ramification that would come about this. If Texas comes in, uh, t uh, this is, and this was another big argument with Mexico. Mexico had outlawed slavery. There was no slavery in Mexico and Texans wanted their slaves to grow what we now refer to as historians as white gold, which is cotton. And, and so we know that if we annex Texas and we be in the United States, that they're going to come in as a slave state. And at this moment, we have a balance of slave and free states in Congress, which, again, in the House of Representatives doesn't necessarily matter. But in the Senate, where everybody gets two, we have an even balance. So no law could ever, you know, we couldn't increase slavery or, like, increase the protection of it. But we also can't get rid of it because it's an even balance. Uh, and so, again, I think it's Polk. Correct. That brings in Texas. Um, and then same guy that wants to fifty four forty or fight. That's no, Polk. is it? It's Polk. Is it Polk? Yeah. So Polk is basically the president before the Civil War that starts to screw everything up, and that's just a personal opinion. Um, I'm pretty sure <laughs> historians would agree with me, or some would. Uh, but he brings. He's the one who annexes Texas, uh, which then Barger just led to our next topic unless do you have anything to add on texas not at the moment no okay so that brings us to our next one do you want to show the map again boop, 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 boop. map time yep so the green the dark green in the upper corner which includes our own state of washington is uh what we know as the oregon country and uh mr barker just brought up a, a slogan that polk runs under which is 5440 or fight and that is a representation of the latitude line of which the United States wants of the Oregon country. And basically up until this point, like Lewis and Clark have gone and explored, 
And now in about the 1840s, we have a big push to go out west to Oregon, and we get what we know as the Oregon Trail. If you want to play the game, go on the emulator. It's super fun to play the games back from when we were kids in. Yep, there you go. Uh, I always got dysentery, though. Um, and you guys can ask. You can Google what dysentery is if you don't already know. Uh, but anyway, we have this big push to go out to Oregon, and it's, it's basically for farming, right? Like, Oregon has trees. It has great soil. You know, it, it's it's the perfect place. But we're also, the government's kind of trying to push people out there because that also means that we start, like I said earlier, to claim the land for ourselves. And the Oregon country has four main uh, countries vying for it. You have the United States, you had Spain, you had Britain, and you had Russia. And the legitimacy of those claims starts to fall off except for the United States and Great Britain. Is Great Britain holding Canada, the United States holding, obviously, the United States. Uh, and Russia kind of creeps back up to Alaska. Spain obviously gets defeated when Mexico gets their independence. Uh, and so that just leaves us in Great Britain buying for the, the Oregon country. Yeah, and understand, like, there's, what is it, like 400,000 people, I think, that come across the Oregon Trail. And then you have, like, thirty to 20,000 people that die on the way you know, and it's not just to Oregon. They're going down into parts of, they're going to Salt Lake City, the Mormon Trail, um, and then going over the Sierra Nevadas into California. Yeah. Or if you're the Donner Party, you yeah. get caught in a blizzard and end up eating each other, but not your own family because you're not animals. Yeah. You have yeah. rules. Kind of label people. Um, yeah, super dark. The Native Americans were going to help them, and then they saw them eating people, and they were like, nah, we're out. Too bad. A ton of snow fell. Like, it was really amazing, like, how much snow fell overnight. A, it was, like, feet. It's a, it's a two feet in one night. And so they're – because they stopped to pick a broken axle, and they figured that they'll just wake up in the morning, and that night, two feet of snow falls. So – Yeah. Well, and it's because also during this time is that people were selling these, like, travel guides. Um, like, you guys obviously live on the internet now, but back in the day, everybody would buy these planets called, like, Lonely Planet Books. And it was travel guides. Like when my wife and I went to Jordan, we were in um, Petra or outside of Petra at Wadi Musa. And like it listed like the restaurants in town that were like acceptable. Like, you know, I give you like recommendation for like what restaurants to use. During the Oregon Trail days, people would write these guides on how to get there. And they would be completely like be like 5% true and like 95% just made up garbage. But you wouldn't know because – you're, I'm selling it to you in St. Louis, and you're going to figure out that it's wrong when you're in Oregon. You know, so I mean, like, it was <laughs> capitalism at its finest. Seriously. Uh, and, and people wrote these without even going west. Like, that's the big thing. It's not It's not that they just made it up for fun. It's the fact that they were, like, they saw a chance to make money, and they had never left St. Louis. They didn't know what was out there. Yeah. And so Polk doesn't get... 5440, which would be like halfway through British Columbia, and it would really screw up our symmetrical border that we have going with Canada. Uh, we end up with settling for the 49th parallel. So if you go get a globe and look at that, one of the problems with that this is kind of a fun aside is that Point Roberts, Washington is a little peninsula that is cut off from the rest of Washington. And the children from Point Roberts have to take a 40 minute bus ride through Canada to get to Blaine School District. Right. And so on an average school day, those kids have to go through four separate border crossings. Yep. I hope they have Nexus cards. Yeah, seriously. Uh, the, and so it's just it, so basically what happens is we we Oregon becomes kind of a wash. Right. Like Polk puffs his chest and tries to get more. The uh, Britain tries to do the same thing where they try to push it. Like so we actually the Columbia River is the boundary. Right. So Washington would be a part of Canada um, and, and they just settle on the continuation of the line. Yeah. And that's the what makes the most sense. You can see the purple above Barker where it says seated by Great Britain in 1818. That's the 49th parallel. And it just becomes the established line. So no war, no nothing there. Um, fun fact, if you ever want to look up the pig war in the San Juan <laughs> Islands, super interesting. Uh, you, if you ever get a chance to go to San Juan Island, you can see the British camp, the American camp. It's, it's really interesting stuff. So, um, which leads us to our last chunk and that is, uh, kind of the orange and blue down there. 
Yeah, which is the uh, what's called the Mexican Session, um, which is a result of the Mexican-American War. So, like we said, the Oregon Trail kind of kicks off in the early 1840s, right after, you know, a little bit after, about five years after Texas kind of gains independence. But as soon as we bring Texas into the Union, less than like a year later, we go to war with Mexico over a border dispute with Texas. Now, it comes down to this. The United States said, well, we want the Rio Grande to be the border, which is further south than what Mexico wanted to be the border, which was the Nueces River, oh, which, is further, which is further north than the Rio Grande. And so the American government essentially puts military patrolmen at the border from the American perspective, which they know is like 30, 40 miles into Mexico from the Mexican perspective. And so... Obviously, when the Mexicans come to army comes to patrol their border and there's Americans tens of miles inside of their country, they react aggressively. And America uses that as a as a justification into defending itself, you know, being provoked into a war with Mexico, which a lot of people since then have like, this is just a great example of the United States getting Mexico to throw a punch and then knowing that we're, you know, carrying a baseball bat behind us, you know, and carrying a baseball bat into a boxing match. So, you know, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, long story short, yeah. the Amer- it doesn't go very well for Mexico. Right. And so here's the thing, like America knows that they can beat Mexico in a toe to toe fight. Like with our, our army versus theirs, we know we'll win just based on industrial might and things like that. Uh, so that's the debate over the river. The rivers become the debate. And then uh, basically the most important thing from the Mexican-American War is obviously the grab of uh, Arizona, what will become Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, Utah, uh, Nevada, but most importantly will be California because of the gold that will be found in 1848. Um, and then people will rush out and we'll have a gold rush in 1849. Hashtag San Francisco 49ers is what they called people who came out for the gold rush. But the other thing that's really important is this is a training ground. The Mexican-American War trains American and Confederate army officers about how to fight wars. And could not be more important. The the general for the whole American army, the, the leader is Winfield Scott. And, and Zachary Taylor will play a huge role, too, and he'll be the 12th president. But Winfield Scott will be the fir- one of the first generals in the Union Army, along with George McClellan, to run the show. However, on the Confederate side, the, probably the best general in the war is a young Army captain named Robert E. Lee. And Robert E. Lee is going to get massive amounts of experience on the battlefields in Mexico and how to handle certain situations. Um, and that will play pivotal in the Amer- drawing out the American Civil War. Yeah, and within about two years of fighting, um, the United States will take capture Mexico City. Um, they'll sign the Treaty of what is it, Guadalupe Hidalgo, in 1848. They will pay Mexico 15 million dollars for what today is the southwestern United States. And then a little bit later, we'll buy the Gadsden, we'll buy this extra little blue piece down here on the bottom of Arizona. The reason for that is that there's mountains above there and you can't really build a good railroad. And so they're like, there's way better, a way better railroad bed if we buy an extra, you know, a little chunk of Mexico. And so we kick them some cash to buy that so that we can run a railroad through there. Don't we kick them 15 million? Don't we kick them like the same amount we paid for the whole session? I thought it was. I thought the Gadsden purchase was almost the same price as the Mexican session, which is so ridiculous. Uh, but again, when we take a look at this, right, like this is how we got from sea to shining sea, and I mean, take a look. The big thing that the book focuses on for our students is: is American expansion justified? And so, in this scenario, right, you have to out. You have to weigh each one of these individual components against each other to try and figure out were the United States government justified in expanding from coast to coast? Yeah. 
ten million dollars. So okay, two thirds so, of this. But I mean, if you look at the the amount of you know yeah. price per acre, you're paying a lot more right money for a lot less land. Yep. So yeah, you look at justification. So is is it justifiable to say I'm stronger than you, so I deserve more? Is that a justifiable response? I mean, you think about the Mongol cultures, they always said that you would have as many horses as you could defend. If I can come to your camp and steal your horses, then you had too many. I mean, that was just the way it was kind of like a cutthroat mentality. You know, like not a lot of countries just sit around and like kumbaya and like, you know, hold hands. The United States and Canada being one of those because the border up there is the largest, longest unfortified border in the world. If you, the border between the United States and Canada is often just like a clear cut. Yep. Right. It's monitored. It's monitored. Just don't think you can walk across. But yeah. um, it's not like the one between the United States and Mexico where there's very publicized right now the wall. You know, and it's, or you think about like North Korea, South Korea, where they have a, a, a militarized zone yep. with machine guns, electrified barbed wire, barbed wire, and like uh, landmines. Yep. So, I mean, think about justifications. Like, you know, should the, should, Ruling with strength, you know, is from a position of power, is that a legitimate yeah. concern? Or should we be a nice guy, mm -hmm. you know, and treat people fairly? And think about the biggest loser in this whole thing, Native Americans. Yes, seriously. And I and, and I feel like we've, we've underplayed it, but also, and I feel like that, and there's no excuse there, it's underplayed, but they're just underrepresented at the table, right? They're, they're not a recognized nation by the world and so therefore they get kind of just steamrolled in this scenario you know because once we go coast to coast then it starts to be relocating these native americans to different spots and moving them um and and burger's head's covering it but that area of texas that we know today is oklahoma that's going to basically become what we call the indian territory and we're going to put you know, hundreds of thousands of people in Oklahoma uh, and tell them, hey, this is your new spot. This is where you're settling. Which is why Arizona and Oklahoma are states 48 and 47 to enter the union because of their large Native American populations. And it's almost a misnomer to use the term Native American because that homogenizes them. It says they're all one thing. Right, when true. These tribes thought of themselves as independent countries. They're just very small independent countries. And that's again, why they don't rise up and fight. People say, well, why didn't they fight back? And it's like, they just weren't organized in the same way. You think about how Europeans took advantage of tribal discrepancies in Africa. The same is very true in North America. Yep. They had small localized, some of them were rather large, but there was historic disputes between them that they didn't, they saw the, the new countries, like the new actors as being an ally to help them defeat historic enemies rather than realizing that the new people were more dangerous than their historic, you know, enemies or uh, rivals. Right. So, yeah. So again, the big, uh, big topic here. It's going to be a longer video, uh, but Excited to talk about. Uh, so this Thursday shenanigan piece is going to be on the giant Asian hornet. Not to be called a murder hornet because they're not going out and murdering humans. There's no premeditation. Correct. Uh, but if there's nothing else. Six Flags. Six Flags is named Six Flags before the Six Flags for the six nations that have ruled over Texas. Ooh. Email. Yeah, can you, can you the, guess them all? Yeah, put in the comments if you can see if you can guess them all. Without looking it up, what six countries have owned Texas? Yep. Good luck. Um, so until next time, I'm the turn. I'm the bark. And we're going to be here a long time. Have a good night, everybody. Stay safe. And be well. <laughs>